Nehemiah, we're talking today about God's masterwork, brand new study, and uh, we'll be coursing through the book of Nehemiah over the next few weeks, and um, I'm looking forward to what God's going to bring to us, and you're going to find and you're going to discover in the book of Nehemiah, our vision will never be any greater than our burden. Now, that may sound a little strange, but as you as we course through this, you're going to understand that statement a whole lot better. Every child of God can have a proper reaction to the despair of our Christian lives. And realizing we see that uh, Nehemiah is a great example to show us how that we can have the right reaction, how that we can have an overcoming spirit, how we can see God do something tremendous in our lives, but it's important that we have to look at things not through the eyes of the world and the flesh. We have to look at things through the eyes of faith. So the book of Nehemiah could read as a sequel actually to the book of Ezra. And I'm going to give you some historical facts through this on the front end of it today. Then we'll get into some issues that I pray will be encouraging to you. So in this historical book, we find that God is going to bring some great information to us. Although the book of Esther appears after Nehemiah, actually Nehemiah is the last historical book in the Old Testament. But realizing the book of Esther appears after Nehemiah in the canon, the, the events in Esther, however, are occupied in the time period between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. So between the first and the second return of the people, to Israel, to the Jews, to Israel. So why is Nehemiah then important? You know, we often think about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls and his encounter with uh, opposition and what he was seeking to do for the glory of God. We got to look at Nehemiah. First, he was not a priest. He was a layman. And uh, he served the Persian king, Artaxerxes, in a particular position, and uh, in a secular, actually, position, before leading a group of Jews home to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the, the walls and rehang the gates of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah's expertise in the king's court, what it did, it equipped him uh, for the political and the physical reconstruction necessary uh, for the remnant to survive, for them to get back, to rebuild, to get back to the things of God. So under Nehemiah's leadership, the Jews... They withstood persecution and opposition, and they came together and accomplished their goal. But there were some challenges in accomplishing that goal. And there were some issues that they had to face. So Nehemiah's humility, and that's a very important thing, and I would underscore that, Nehemiah's humility before God provided an example to the people of his relationship with the Lord. So together, Nehemiah and Ezra led the spiritual revival of the people getting restoration or giving restoration to the Jews. So it's a pretty important thing. Now, several things that we see happen here, and three bullets for you, it's in your study guide. Nehemiah exhibited a steadfast determination, and that's one thing that I really respect about him. Here's a great leadership book for you. If you want to discover how to be a great leader, read the book of Nehemiah and apply it to your life. But realizing he had a, a, a really a steadfast, stick to determination to complete his goal, therefore it, re, it resulted in a people that basically encountered three things. One, they were encouraged. So therefore, it's really important that we, the people of God, be encouragers today. I know there's a lot of things bad going on. I know you can look on the internet, pick up the newspaper, listen to television, whatever, and, and it's just you're inundated with nothing but bad news. But we today have the good news of the gospel, and we are to be encouragers to those today that don't know Christ and encouragers to those today who do know Christ. Secondly, uh, he provided a means of renewal or to be renewed. And you know it's really important that we don't get hung up just hanging out, coming to church, going through the motions. We, re we need spiritual renewal in our lives. And the third thing is, is that it was excited. And you know, I'm telling you, when you get encouraged, you get renewed, you will become excited. And God wants his children excited today. We've got the greatest news in this world. 
We've got the greatest news that will change your future. We've got the greatest news that there is on planet Earth. And that is the fact, or even in the universe. And that's the fact that we serve a risen Savior. And there's no better news than that. Today we're going to begin with Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to read the entirety of chapter 1. So let's open our Bibles as you can follow on screen or follow on your Word or on your telephones or iPads or cobblestones or whatever else you've got that you're reading off of. Amen. So uh, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chisalu in the 20th year, and I was in Sushan, or Susa, uh, the palace. And then Hanai, uh, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, there is, uh, there is the province uh, are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem are broken, is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So it's a pretty devastating time. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down, wept, mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. That verse right there is the catapult. It is the beginning. It's the process. If you omit this, anything that's going to happen beyond that is not going to happen. So the first thing that he did, he came apart and he got apart. He prayed, he fasted, he wept, he mourned, he called upon the Lord God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be attentive and thy eyes be open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now and night, uh, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against. Now notice, he didn't say, they have sinned against you, God. He said, we. He included himself. We have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. That was a promise from God. They did it, and that's what happened. But if ye return, here's the other part. Hallelujah. I'm glad God just doesn't serve justice. I'm glad he also has mercy. But if ye return or turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were... Uh, of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let not thine ear be, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servant and desires to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Interesting about Nehemiah, his position with the king, being a cupbearer, and also the influence that he had on Artaxerxes. We'll get to that later. But it's been noted that there are many historical documents that describe the magnificent buildings that have been constructed through time. You can look back and you can see evidence of them. And recently, we've heard and saw about, of course, the fire that happened at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. And all those uh, that built that structure and realizing that structure was built over 800 years ago, it was built in such a particular way that they didn't have CAD systems and computers and all the other uh, fineries that we have in our uh, generation of today of coming to building. I mean, you think back that many years and what happened, 
that uh, Notre Dame caught on fire, but the whole structure, the way it was designed, it was designed so the whole structure would not burn. Now, the historical documents goes basically into the minds of those who went about building these structures. Um, there are countries you can go into. I know that if you go to Japan, I've been to Japan, and they build many of their buildings on cushions. And that cushion will tolerate earthquakes and other things that will cause the building to actually move as the earth is shifting and moving if it's quaking. And there's many other types of uh, not, uh, architectural things that they do in order to accommodate for things. People have always been interested in the construction or rebuilding projects. I've always, in growing up in a construction family in a, that type of environment, it's always kind of been a pet thing with me. I enjoy reading about and studying things. But there's a historical record of the, of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, its temple, and it had been destroyed, of course, by the, by the Babylonians. Um, this is found, of course, in the book of Nehemiah, as we're seeing. So to begin with, we get a portion of history in Nehemiah, and that's okay because it's good to understand how it got to this point, what caused, and what would be the results uh, through this process that they had to face. So the book was, was, was not written to tell history. Understand the book was written for history's sake, but Nehemiah was writing so that we, today, God was using him, that we could understand how God works in history. So we can look back through these pages of the Old Testament and we can see the miraculous ways that God worked, provided in what he did. So Nehemiah tells the story of God's people coming back to establish their identity as God's chosen people. You know, this is an amazing thing with God. Here's another great, if you want a New Testament proof that goes back even to the Old Testament. Even when they sinned, when the children of Israel were disobedient to God, He did not remove them from the family. He gave them an opportunity to be restored. So, you know, in our light of New Testament saints today, God doesn't kick us out of the family either. So when we sin or we make bad decisions that create a sinful atmosphere, I'm glad that we have a God who's a forgiving God and a merciful God. And there's never a day that God stops loving you nor I today. Amen. So the scripture in Nehemiah, they, they tell the story of God's relationship with his covenant or his promised people. So in this study of Nehemiah, we're going to see several things. One, we're going to learn a lot about even ourselves through the process that Nehemiah went through with the Jews and the rebuilding of the walls and the gates. Secondly, we're going to learn leadership principles. We never get to the place that we don't need to learn, and principles in leadership is very important because each of you in some capacity have leadership responsibilities in your life, in your family, in your job, or whatever the case may be. Thirdly, we're going to discover God's promises, His covenants, that what God says, God keeps. What God says he will do, he shall do. Then we're going to look at God's plans. Do you realize God has plans? And you read, I'm so glad he has a plan for us to do today to be blessed. Not to destroy us, but to bless us. God has a plan today. It's his will that all come to him and receive him. It's his plan that we live for him. Really, there's a lot of things that God has for us in the greatest planning book for your life that you can read, and it's called the Holy Bible. And then lastly, we're going to see the future that God has for us. Man, I'm glad our future is bright, wonderful, and that we're going to be with Him forevermore. So the book of Nehemiah describes, it's kind of a transitional state of the nation of Israel, and also the book speaks of our transition in life and how that this book affects us. So here's the bottom line. Today, if you want a bottom line, here it is. God was faithful to Nehemiah and to his people. And you know what? God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is always, always faithful to us. So God has demonstrated himself faithful. He's demonstrated himself faithful to this ministry, to GBC. He's demonstrated himself to be faithful to each one of us individually today as his people. So 
Going into and looking and scanning over the first part of Nehemiah 1, we find in verse 1 and 2, the month there is what we know as in the time of November or December. Now, remember, Nebuchadnezzar had, looking back in time a little bit, Nebuchadnezzar had torn down walls of Jerusalem 144 years as recorded in the book of 2 Kings. Now, the city was taken and the Israelites were taken into captivity in Babylon, and that is in the year of 586 B.C. Now, remember, when you're dealing with B.C., the years are going down. You, when you get then after Christ, the years go up. So you're going to see that the years are transitioning down, not going up. So further back in time, the Israelites had, had divided into two kingdoms. That happened in 930 B.C. So it had been a single kingdom prior to that for Saul's reign, for David's reign, and also for Solomon's reign. But there had been challenges during the end of King David's reign. And of course, Solomon died, Rehoboam became king, and that's when the nation split. There was turmoil, there was conflict. And so they turned into two kingdoms. So now you have the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and then you have the southern kingdom, which is Judah. So this lasted in a time frame about 200 years. And so then the Assyrians came and, des and destroyed the northern kingdom and only Judah's left. In 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed and the walls were torn down and the people were taken into captivity. And it's real interesting here. And as I read there, there's every situation. When Moses was leading the children of Israel through the, uh, the desert there after their exodus out of, out of Egypt, what was the problem with Israel? What has been the problem with Israel right on through? What has been the problem with all humanity right on through? It's a disobedience issue. They, they will not follow the commands or the directives of God that is found in His Word. And the, you would thought the Israelites, well, even more uh, defined, you would think we would learn, you know, God's not going to bless you when you're not serving Him. When you're not sold out to him, when you're not following his word, God's not just going to bless you because you're a Christian. He's going to bless you because you're faithful to him. Keep that in mind. So the Bible is clear that the invasion and the destruction and the exile was because of the Israelites there. Let's pin it down to this word. Unfaithfulness. Because unfaithfulness then has a long list of things underneath it that we find ourselves in. It begins with being unfaithful. And I'm going to tell you, you start getting unfaithful to God, His house, His word in prayer, things like that, you're headed down a spiral that's going to land you flat on your face. So it's better to obey the Lord, isn't it? Amen. So the reason the temple was destroyed, the walls were knocked down, was because the people had a heart of unfaithfulness. They had misplaced priorities. Their lives were not where it should be. So get this right. God is a just God, right? So he will for, not forever today keep his wrath against us. Now, I gave you in your study guide a timeline so you can see some things. The divided kingdom, 5, 930 B.C. The northern kingdom falls, 722 B.C. Southern kingdom falls, Babylonian exile, 586 B.C. Cyrus then allows the Jews to return, that's 538 B.C. Then the temple is completed, 516 B.C. Ezra leads a group to Jerusalem, that's 458 B.C. And Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, that's 444 B.C. So when Cyrus permitted the Jews to go back and to rebuild the temple and walls, there was only about 50,000 that went. There was far more people than that. And it was sad that there were millions of Jews in exile in Babylon, but only 50,000 wanted to go back. So, so few, and here's the reason, they didn't love God. That was their problem, and that was, has been their problem all along. So realizing that, they, they wanted to live in what they were familiar with, and they didn't want to de dedicate themselves to God. It was a total lack of love for God and the things of God. Times have not changed in that sense. People today are in the same position. However, they were met with opposition. You're not going to sin against God and get by with it. Bottom line. So the foundation had been laid 
each stone in place. But because of the opposition, you know what they did? They gave up. You know, we start out, and boy, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm on fire for Christ. I'm all charged up, revived, and sanctified, and spirit-filled. And our little struggle comes along in life. And, buddy, I tell you what, we just, we fizzle out. Because anytime we're facing struggle, opposition, difficulty, it seems like we wane in our spiritual life. We lose our spiritual focus. So they stopped focusing on what God had called them to do. And they got into their own stuff and they got into their own agendas. That's a problem we face too, isn't it? Haggai said, give careful thought to your ways. Your ways should be the ways of God. We throw our lives away focusing upon ourselves rather than focusing upon the Lord. So the Lord was not happy because they lost their focus and they had lost their perseverance and they had lost their endurance. So now they're going to have to pay the price. However, however, even in that position of where they were at and away from God, God still had a plan for them. And his plan would be carried out because he would choose and use a man by the name of Nehemiah. God would work a miracle. What was impossible, God would make possible through his man Nehemiah. So the reason that Nehemiah wanted the walls uh, built and the gates rehung was because, you know, they really could stand and they needed God back in their lives. And so Nehemiah was a man, he surrendered to what God would desire for them to do. How could God then use Nehemiah? How could he really move on their hearts and their lives? Because Nehemiah, he lived and he walked in faith. We have to do the same thing, folks. Ezra was a priest. He had gone back to call the people to the ways of God. But realizing today with Nehemiah, he comes in and is going to reestablish a nation and the theological un underpinning of that nation and get these people back to God. It may even seem impossible, but I'm glad with God all things are possible. So God chose a man who would build a wall around Jerusalem in just less than seven weeks. I mean, he, 52 days he would accomplish this great task. So this is an amazing thing. They would do what could not have been done. And so Nehemiah is attending to the king in Sushan and Susa. And, and a brother comes and Nehemiah asks, you know how things are going uh, about the rehanging of the gates and the rebuilding of the walls. And here's the report in verse 3. The walls of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah was hopeful of progress. He thought he was going to get a good progress report. And basically what the, the person said was, no change, man. The people have lost heart for God. They're more about doing their thing than doing God's thing. So Nehemiah was hopeful, but there was no progress. Therefore, the people are not doing what God had prescribed and declared for them to do. So Nehemiah then became deeply moved by the power of God. And he began, and this is what happened. He didn't get mad, he didn't get furious. What he did, he started praying. He started weeping. He started fasting. And you know what? He did it for days. And not only did he pray, but let me tell you what, he did something that we need to do as a church. Fast. Fast and pray. So the people would not grasp onto the things of God. But notice, Nehemiah doesn't just sit in his emotions. He just didn't say and sit and feel sorry about the situation. After he had prayed, fasted, and sought God, he then he found the plan of God, and he initiated and put that plan into motion. Don't ever go off. Don't you do anything unless you pray. I don't care what you're doing. You always begin with prayer. You always seek God in prayer. Because if you don't, you're going to fall flat on your face. Prayer gets God's attention. And prayer brings God's direction. So Nehemiah turns to God. The first attribute of Nehemiah is Nehemiah is a faithful person. Can God say that of you and I today? Are we faithful to the Lord? Well, I'm faithful to come to church, preacher. It's more to it than that. That's real important, too. 
So Nehemiah had an incredible faith in God. He turned to God. And you know what? He showed his spiritual focus. That his focus was upon God. Nehemiah didn't freak out. Me Nehemiah reached out. Amen. You know what happens to us many times? We freak out with what we're going through, what we're facing, what we're encountering, what things are happening in our lives. We get all tied up and messed up and freaked out. Folks, this is not the place to freak out. This is a place to reach out to God. So with us, when we receive bad news, our first reaction is, oh my, what am I going to do? I mean, we just fall apart. When you get bad news, learn to reach to, out to God. Call unto me and I will answer thee, he says. So Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Additionally, before formulating the plan, then ne Nehemiah prayed. This is the type of person that we should be. So in 13 chapters of Nehemiah, there are 12 mentions of prayer. It shows importance, doesn't it? The power of prayer is the cornerstone for anything that we're going to do that is going to last and give glory and praise to God. Now let me wrap up here real quick in the next couple of minutes. He was a man who fought on his knees. You've got to pray. Four elements of Nehemiah's prayer that will help you when you pray. Number one, Nehemiah acknowledged who God is. You and I have to acknowledge who God is. Nehemiah praised God for he was the Lord God. He didn't go shattered and broken. He went before God with praise and thanksgiving upon his heart. The first thing Nehemiah did to, with God was he acknowledged that God is a covenant keeping God. He also acknowledged that God is a God who keeps his word. So Nehemiah recognized God was in charge of everything and nothing was too difficult for the Lord. Amen. So before you do anything, you should always lift up your voice before the Lord. Secondly, Nehemiah repents. Nehemiah began confessing the sins and true leadership is recognizing our sinfulness because we all are sinful. So repentance brings about humility in our lives before Almighty God. If today, if you really want to get where you need to be with God, come to Him in repentance and come to Him today in humility. Third, go and ask God what you need. And I'm glad you can call on God and He will answer you. Amen. So what did Nehemiah do? He prayed. This is important. He didn't pray his words. He prayed the Word of God. And we need to pray God's word today. And because God's word gives us a promise. And for today, Nehemiah yielded to the Lord. So Nehemiah recognized he was the servant and God is the master. So do you just see what I gave you? P-R-A-Y. Praise, repent, ask, yield. And that's exactly what we need to do in our lives. So God placed Nehemiah in this particular position for a, with a particular plan to accomplish a particular task. Now, I've got three things, three applications. These two are quick, so hang on, buckle your seatbelt. Don't underestimate God's ability to use you. Don't listen to what other people say. Listen, God sought Nehemiah, and Nehemiah sought to be faithful to God. Secondly, prayer is not a substitute for action, but it's the foundation of our action. If you're not praying, listen, you're missing the most important part in the equation. Prayer is not supplemental. Prayer is foundational. Third, leadership matters. A great leader of people is a great follower of the Lord. And if you're going to be a great leader, you've got to be a great follower of Jesus. Amen. So God's looking for you today. Listen, he's looking for your service. Are we giving it to him today? One final note here. Nehemiah proves impossible things happen today. We face impossible situations in our lives, but only impossible things will happen when we go to God. For with God, all things are possible. And the church said, Amen. thank you, Father. Thank you for your blessed word that has a place of lodging in our hearts of transformation. Thank you that, Lord, you are merciful and you are good to us. And, Lord, even when we miss the mark, thank God you don't drop us. You carry us and you bring us back. I pray today that we will search out the scriptures today in Nehemiah. And we will find today great strength. 
And we'll find today that, Lord, you want to use us and you want us to be a part of the plan that you have for us today. Now, Lord, as we close this time of, of Bible study, I pray that hearts have been challenged and tested and blessed. And I pray as we go into worship today, may our hearts rejoice in the Lord and be exceedingly glad. For great is our God and greatly to be praised. Have your will in your way in this church today. And may hearts be touched, souls saved, and people blessed. And all the praise we give to you in Jesus' name. All God's servants shouted, Amen. Amen. Going to give him a praise offering. Amen.